just want to quickly introduce Professor Jacqueline Gottlieb, Associate, Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Columbia University. Full professor. Full professor. Amazing. Great. Better. Even better. Um, she and her lab want to understand how the brain generates intelligent behavior, and in particular, how it learns, reasons, and makes decisions in the changing world. A central interest in the lab is the neural basis of working memory and selective attention. And in this talk today, she'll be talking about curiosity and the current decision, the current decision paradigm. Thank you, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you for organizing this and for setting up a center for curiosity. I think it's a phenomenally um, important question. So I'm going to pick up on some of the questions that were asked at the end of Celeste's uh, talk. And I'm coming to this question from um, a different perspective. I've, uh, I've started, I'm a neuroscientist by training. I started st studying eye movements and attention. And I became interested in questions, in the question of uh, how come we attend to certain things? Uh, when we look in the brain, uh, we can see uh, clear signals that the brain generates that direct you to attend to a particular location or feature or to move your eye to that location. We know that those signals are there in specific brain areas. We kind of have an idea what they do, but we don't have any idea of how they come about. So this is, um, and as I started um, asking this question, I became more and more amazed that actually we don't have answers in our field to this question. So somehow it's like a forgotten question. We all take for granted that we direct attention and eye movements, but nobody has asked why. It just seems so obvious. It's just something we do, like apples fall from a tree, we look around. Okay. So, um, and so I've been started, I, I started thinking about this question, you know, it's a number of years now, and it took me to very far, uh, far ranging fields, such as they took me where I am today, right? It turns out it's an enormously huge cognitive uh, question, a very complicated one. Okay. So, okay, so what I want to talk then, um, I will tell you something of, of what I have learned about this question, and I will link these forms of information sampling, the very simple things that we do several times a second, like directing our eyes and looking at something, to type of information sampling, and I'll try to uh, find links between that, a very mundane behavior, and curiosity, the kinds of things that Celeste talked about, which uh, is clearly much more complex behavior, and we can we can talk about what, um, what is the relationship between these. So attention and eye movements in neuroscience have been very closely related to decision making. Uh, so I will uh, try to put curiosity and information sampling in the context of decision making. What, what does that mean for the, for, for the way that we make decisions, which clearly is something we want to understand? Um, and then I will talk about how we study decision making. I would argue that it's way too simplified uh, to do justice to our cognitive abilities. I will, uh, argue, and then I'll talk about some uh, attempts to extend that those those tasks by simply act, uh, adding an active sampling task uh, step. It's a simple mani uh, experimental manipulation, but it really you will see that it complicates the analysis quite a bit. Uh, and so. Um, I'll talk about what we have learned using these sort of active sampling tasks so far, which is still fairly new in our field, and then uh, what we can learn and why it's important that we look at them. So um, just an aside, so I'm here, my, my main work has to do with uh, neurophysiological recordings um, with, in animals, so I have access to the, to the neurophysiology, and, um, I, th and, and I, could, I could really give at least three talks on this topic. So I had to choose uh, one type of work that we do. And I chose not to speak about the, uh, the biology, the, the neurophysiological data that we have on this, uh, because I thought, at least for this audience, it may be more interesting to talk about the behavior. And also because defining the, we are, we are at the stage where we really need to define our behavior before we can go into the brain. Um, so I thought that, def so, so I'm going to talk about some behavioral experiments that we did with humans. Um, uh, so rather than neurobiological data, but we can, we can talk about that in the, if, if you guys have questions. All right, so let me start uh, with this um, 
let's, let's think a little bit about what we have learned about decision making using the standard uh, neuroscientific approach. So I think that we have come, when we look into the brain, we have really come uh, quite a long way in delineating some of the circuits that may be involved in uh, decision making. And we study two main, main kinds of decision making. One kind is called perceptual decision making, such as uh, you, 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 know, you look at something and you decide what it is. Uh, you look at a bus and you decide if you're moving to the right or to the left, or you recognize it, or so on. And we know, uh, we have learned quite a bit about the organization of the visual system, so here, uh, of, the, of the sensory motor loop, I should say. So for example, this is in the domain of vision. We know that vision is processed, primary visual cortex. Then there two, uh, there's a dorsal pathway, a ventral pathway that conveys information in hierarchical fashion. And then towards, as information gets transmitted to the front of the brain and also subcortical structures, it becomes more and more linked with the actions uh, that we plan to do. And there's a lot of feedback at all levels of this pathway, okay? So these are circuits that make sensory motor decision, linking sensory in input with actions. We also have learned something about circuits that do value-based decision, reward-based decisions. And we know that a subcortical structure, um, uh, the, the dopamine, dopamine and the basal ganglia are very important. And we know that um, there, um, there are also connections with the frontal lobe. There are several frontal structures that are implicated in uh, value-based decision, the kinds in deciding what we like, what we don't like, what's better for us, what's worse for us. All right. So, um, okay. And yet, I think as we, as we read this literature, there's a fundamental tension that, that uh, stays in, in the study of decision making. And that is that if, if you read this very simple laboratory paradigms, the conclusions of the papers, they come up over and over in saying that we are really optimal. So here's the, the behavior, and it's amazing how animals become optimal, and people become optimal, and it's just wonderful, right? So in whatever situation we put them, people can maximize the rewards and minimize the cost, and they do these feats of probabilistic reasoning. Not only people, but monkeys and rats and everybody. Um, it's just amazing. It's like the best outcome in the best of all possible worlds. I mean, it's totally Panglossian. Everything's wonderful. And then you actually you open a newspaper, and you see, well, maybe things are really not quite so wonderful. <laughs> And, um, you know, and, and then there's also, uh, you know, uh, scientific evidence that show that the moment you make the task a little bit more complicated, you run into cognitive limits, inattention, and limits of memory. Um, you come in, uh, you run into things such as temporal discounting and just, you know, pathology, outright pathology. And perhaps most influential, there's the work by Kahneman and Tversky in behavioral economics that has demonstrated in a systematic way that people actually don't, may not do those computations that we think that they do. Uh, we probably, well, sorry, we don't, we, we may not, um, you know, represent probability distributions and we don't reason with probability. Probability is a big thing. But we don't reason correctly, right? So it seems that not only are we limited, uh, we have cognitive limitations as any biological system would, but we don't even do the kind of computations that a mathematical analysis that seems to work in a laboratory s says that we do. Okay, so, uh, so what is going on here? And I would say that a big uh, uh, part, uh, I want to propose that a big part of this tension is due to the fact that the tasks that we study in the laboratory are very, very simple, way too simple. And they're simple in a very specific way in that the decision maker knows almost everything about the task, right? So, uh, for example, okay, so here I'm illustrating uh, two paradigms. This is a classical paradigm used to study perceptual decisions. What happens here is you have a person or a monkey, they fixate, they have two alternatives. At the end of the uh, trial, they have to choose right or left. Uh, and they have a source of information. The, there's a, a patch of moving dots appears on the screen. And if the dots are, uh, and the dots, there's some noise in the dots, right? So there's a little bit of difficulty in determining which way the dots are moving. But the rule, if, if the dots are moving to the right, make an eye movement to the right. If the dots are moving to the left, make an eye movement to the left. Um, 
and that's it. And then if you're a monkey, you get a drop of juice. If you're a person, you might get a point or two and, and then the payoff. In value-based decisions, likewise, we have two options. There's one dot on the right, one dot on the left, and you might learn something about the distribution of rewards that you will get, and then you just make a choice, right? So this is what we call decision-making in the lab. Um, and pretty much everything is known to the actor here, right? The relevant actions are known. There are only two targets, only two options in my world. The investigative strategy is known. This is my source of information, is those random dots, right? I know what to look at, and I know what will happen when I look at it. I know it's going to take me a fraction of a second to discriminate that motion, and then I know that to make my eye movement, right? So there's minimal freedom that a decision maker has here. What is the freedom that we have? What can we decide? So you decide to go, to go right or left, and you also have a little bit of freedom of how long to look at that motion. So you have some speed accuracy trade-off. Uh, to make. And this, in other in, in tasks that are slightly more complex, you might have an exploration exploitation. So you might decide to check out an option that you're less certain about versus exploiting a better known option. But these are really minimal uh, freedoms. And given this amount of knowledge and the simplicity, uh, of course, uh, we, we figure it out. And actually, the question is, why does it take so long to optimize our behavior to those sometimes something that goes glossed over is that it takes quite a bit of training even in those simple tasks. OK, so the bottom line is that in the laboratory, our, the decision maker that we portray in the laboratory at, has near perfect knowledge of their decision situation. They're learned to learn a little bit, maybe, a little bit of exploration, but there is no discovery involved because the structure of the task is so well known. OK, and yet, our brains, especially for humans, seem to be adapted for discovery. So if there's anything that's amazingly uh, unique about humans, is how far we have transformed our environments. This is how we started, and you see how we live now. This is all through active learning and discovery. So we have some uh, adaptation for that as humans, right? And we do this even though we don't know a lot about the world, right? The world is way too complex for us to fully understand. We actually have very limited knowledge. So, and, and so, so this is the, um, the big mystery here, is how did we uh, manage to do this? What does this entail? So I would argue that if you really un want to understand cognition, particularly human cognition, you have to start from this, because this is what we're doing, and this is what the brain is adapted to. All right. So let's try to unpack this a little bit. So let's say you're, you're an early human there, and you play with stones, and you notice a spark flies in the stone. Okay. Now, some humans at some point decided to get curious about that spark. So let's see, what, what would it take to, to motivate us to investigate that phenomenon? right? And again, let me bring you back to the laboratory, a simplified paradigm here where, again, the relevant actions are known, the investigative strategy is known, including the sources of information, the costs and benefits, and the goal is known, right? If you're a monkey in the laboratory, you know you're going to get juice. You just have, right, you know what to do. So uh, contrast that to these uh, early humans. They don't know any of that, right, when they see the spark. What do I do with the spark? Does it mean anything? I have a bazillion things I could be looking at. Um, why the spark? Is the spark special? Um, and if I do get curious about the spark, how should I go about investigating it? Should I ask my local wise man? Or should I look at the stones? Or should I look up at the sky? What should I do? The investigative action is not clear. The source of information is not known. And if I decide to pursue any one of these investigative actions, um, how long will it take? Will I get my answer right away, or will I get, or will it take me, uh, you know, a hundred thousand years? Um, right. And so, so none of this is known, right? So we're, this is getting back to the information gap. In this kind of curiosity, you have really no clue about the information gap because you don't know what you're looking for, and you don't even know what's the point of investigating the spark. Is there a benefit, right? As it turns out, there's an enormous 
benefit, but you don't know that at the time you get curious about that particular item, right? Okay, so all this means is that we cannot reason that, that our brains are adapted in making decisions in a different uh, way than we, think, uh, than we think they are. So how are these ways different? Okay, so one thing that this implies that because the goals are not known, so I, d I cannot know ahead of time that the spark will bring me a lot of energy in the future. Uh, therefore, to make the decision to investigate it, I must have a proximal motivation to learn. So, right? so the brain, so this gets to the question of the, the values. We have to have some reward system that rewards learning, some type of learning and information gathering. Right? So there must be something intrinsic. Um, okay? And also, the, because the investigative strategy is not known, we cannot easily, in general, do things such as, well, should I investigate this? It's going to take me uh, you know, three hours, and then I'll be done. And then if I have 20 hours to spend on this, right? we, cannot, we cannot do that calculus very easily. Right? In any way, it cannot be optimal. So we must, must use uh, some uh, heuristics of some sort. Right? So we have to take short. OK, now, these, these ideas are not new. Um, they have been recognized in different disciplines. Uh, so for example, uh, people who, uh, who work with on complex decision making right, um, have, um, have, have recognized these same limitations. In general, we, have to, we, we can't compute the optimal cost-benefit analysis. Um, and so, for example, Giga Renser is one proponent of this adaptive rationality um, idea. Anyway, it's a, it's a long story. We can, we can discuss it later. Um, Nick Chater and others uh, who have recognized this. Um, th some of these ideas have also been recognized by people who work in social and effective and educational psychology. Berlin was an early writer uh, about the road about curiosity, about the intrinsic motivation to learn. Um, Sylvia wrote about, you know, why do people develop interests? Ryan and Decci speak about um, intrinsic motivation in education and so on. Um, where we have this gap in knowledge is cognitive neuroscience. So in cognitive neuroscience, we really still operate under that illusion that everything is optimal uh, and, and these simplified paradigms are really uh, meaningful. Um, so I think that this is where I see a need, and, and this is, by the way, why we have trouble understanding higher level cognitive constructs such as attention. Okay, so I think that this is where uh, we have been focused on uh, addressing this gap a little bit. So in order to address this, we need, we still need controlled behavior paradigms. We still, we cannot just go out and, and just observe natural behavior. There's just uh, too complicated for us to understand. I mean, if we could understand it, it would be ideal, but that's too complicated, so we need controlled experiments. Okay, so we need to develop active information sampling paradigms. How are we going to do that? Okay, so, all right, so let's, um, so, so let's just take a step, and let's again consider the simple decision paradigm that we have. So this decision paradigm would start by, can you see that's a traffic light, that's red. OK, so we start by giving your person, your decision maker, the, you give them the information that you want. So here's a traffic light, and it's red. And then, presumably, you infer something about the state of the world, right? You believe that the world is one where you should stop, given that the light is red. And then you, uh, sorry, you, the world is one where there is traffic that could hit you, given that that's red. And therefore, you infer that you should stop. Right, the action given that state of the world. And given that, you expect to see an outcome. It's going to be good for you if you stop at a red traffic light. OK, so what we need to do is simply recognize that a decision situation doesn't start with a given sort of information. It starts with a whole bunch of information. And before forming beliefs and so on, you have to decide which one of these sources to sample. Right? So all we have to do in the laboratory then is add a, a step before uh, choosing what to do. We let you choose what you want to look at, right? All right, so there are two types of these paradigms that have been already be, uh, used in the laboratory. One is what I've shown you just now, 
which we called an instrumental sampling paradigm in which you select the source of information that you want to look at or attend to, then you use it to choose an action and realize an outcome. So that's the kind of thing that we do all the time. We look, we act, and then uh, we observe an outcome, right? So the beliefs inform our actions. And then, um, okay, it turns out that even this is uh, quite difficult to analyze. If you notice here, there are a lot of hidden beliefs, right? Uh, beliefs upon beliefs. So for example, when I select a source like the traffic light, I must have a belief about what signals I might see when I look at the traffic light, that it's red or green, and those, this, this can be complex distributions. Then I have beliefs about what each signal means about the state of the world. So I have to form beliefs over beliefs, distributions of distributions, and then what I should do, and so on and so forth. So we try to analyze some of these paradigms. Uh, as some of my students can attest to, it can be a real bear. Um, and, and it becomes a very heavy model selection exercise because there's so many hidden, uh, hidden things in there. OK, so one useful way to simplify this in the laboratory is to say, OK, there is a source of information that you can select. But let's say that I don't allow you to act uh, on that information, right? So that information tells you something about the outcome that you will receive, right? Uh, th but there's nothing you can do about it. And that simplifies, it takes out at least one layer. And it may, so, um, right? Now you can see that this is uh, somewhat of, a, again, a, a little bit of a contrived paradigm because normally we always want to act on the information. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's, a, it's a useful paradigm that has produced some insights. Okay, so um, all right. So what I wanted to, to do next is to show you an example of such a non-instrumental sampling paradigm uh, that we did in humans that gets to the question about what precisely is it that motivates us to be interested in a source of information. Okay. Um, okay, so first there's a background to this. I should say that there have been several studies uh, using both kinds of paradigms, instrumental and non-instrumental, uh, that really show that there are in the brain intrinsic uh, value functions, that the brain values obtaining information above and beyond what reward you might get by acting on that information. Okay? And the neural correlates of those intrinsic value systems are found in areas related to attention in the cortex and in uh, things like the dopamine uh, structures that, uh, that are central for, for motivation. Okay, and it has also been proposed in the literature. Okay, so now getting to the question, what, what, what is that intrinsic motivation? There are two motives that have been proposed in the literature. So one is the idea that people have an intrinsic preference for the early resolution of uncertainty. And that is the idea that, so imagine that you're in a situation and you, you, you're going to receive some outcome. Let's say somebody plays a lottery. You might get a small prize or a large prize. Uh, you don't know what you're going to get. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, nevertheless, you may have a preference for knowing early, right? So you have the option of choosing, do I want to know what I'm going to get early or late? Uh, there is, so, so this is the, the idea that people just want to resolve uncertainty. That being in a state of uncertainty is costly and you want to resolve it as early as possible. And another idea that has been proposed in the literature is a little bit different. And that is that, um, that we actually prefer to think about certain things and not others, right? Um, so, for example, we might, and, and so we like to think about good things, right? We want to have information early about some desirable outcome. So I might want to, you know, research an upcoming vacation that I may take next summer um, just because it's fun and it puts me in a good state of, uh, of mind. On the other hand, I may not want to think about uh, a bad outcome, right? And this is called dread. And this has been used to explain why people avoid, for example, medical information, right? So if I, I may avoid learning about some diagnos diagno diagnosis uh, that could be uh, not very pleasant, okay? 
So this is a very different uh, flavor of theory, which you notice is not really normative because you're not reducing uncertainty per se, so it's not information per se. You just like certain states of mind. All right, so these are uh, theoretical uh, predictions. So uncertainty reduction is formalized in an in a economic model. It's called the Krebs-Porteous model. That has, it's a utility model. Pure theory, it's used in economic theory, but it's, again, theory. Uh, this idea of anticipatory utility uh, is also a theoretical model. It's a paper that was just published uh, uh, based on, um, it's, it's from, from Peter Dayan and his colleagues. Um, but there's very little evidence, in fact there's no evidence, to dissociate these motives and see uh, which one is better, which one describes behavior uh, more accurately. So this is what we wanted to do with this uh, paradigm that I'm going to tell you now. Okay, so this paradigm emulates a situation, in, uh, emulates a condition in which you have two sources of information that are relevant to the single payoff. And this is what happens in most natural, in many interesting decision situations. For example, like buying a house, you have several attributes you must track when you buy a house. If you're a manager that evaluates an investment portfolio, you might have several assets and you, you track, they, they're both relevant to your outcome. Okay, so um, okay, so this is so so we we, we try to uh, to put this in a very simplified paradigm, in which we told people we gave people two lotteries on each trial. You can think the, of those as two assets that contribute to your portfolio. So and we indicated each lottery had an average value, let's say of two hundred ten or three hundred points, and each lottery also had an uncertainty. So we show people the range. This lottery can. Uh, provide uh, a prize somewhere in this range, okay? Um, so, um, okay, and, uh, and the game was that the computer would, will draw one prize from each lottery, so one prize from this one and one prize from that one, and add, give both prizes, to put both prizes in your bank. And after you played a number of these trials, will randomly select one prize and give it to you as a bonus uh, in money, okay? So you get a prize from each lottery. This is out of your control. This is just a game of chance. There's nothing you can do to influence the payoffs. But uh, we tell you that we will not tell you the precise value of each prize. You can only learn about one. Which one are you more curious to know ahead of time, okay? Okay, so in each... Um, so in each uh, trial, we had one of the lotteries had high uncertainty, high variance. There would be this one, and another one had low variance. Okay, and they also varied in their average value. So the their values could be so the the low variance could be higher value as in this example, but they could also be equal, and it could also be the other way around. So we manipulated expected value and variance independently. Okay, so um, which information would you which information would you be more curious about? Let's say if I told you I, you have one price from there and one from there, which one would you want to know? <laughs> okay. One. What? Yeah. Asset one. Yes. Yeah. Why? Less because you're less sure about it. Okay. But, but the expected values are close enough. I mean, if asset one's expected value is 20, then it wouldn't, it's not making a difference. Right. Well, it turns out that, so you got it right, uh, it turns out that that is the normative prediction. Uh, you should always attend to the high variance asset. And, but it's a little different than what you said. It's funny, you're in the majority of our participants. Expected value should make absolutely no difference to your decision here. Even if you were a million dollars apart, it really should not matter. Okay, so just to give you an intuition, so imagine that you ask uh, to reveal the high variance one. So uh, you might, I might say, okay, here it is. That's your precise prize. And now you know that your sum is equal to that prize plus some amount from the remaining distribution, right? And that uncertainty is low because the remaining distribution is, is, has small variance. So you reduce your uncertainty about the total. Now imagine that you attend to the low variance, and I tell you, okay, here it is. Again, you know that, that your, your total price is equal to that plus some 
other amount that has a higher uncertainty. And you notice, and, and so this difference is constant, right? You have higher uncertainty in this case than in this case, but you can see that the height of this line makes absolutely no difference. The relationship remains exactly the same. Okay. All right, so the normative economic mathematical prediction is that people should be entirely insensitive to the value of the assets. They should only inquire strictly based on uncertainty. Uh, okay, um, and okay, so I said all this. Okay, and so do people behave like that? And the answer is no, only a, a minority of people behave like that. So what we're plotting here on the x-axis is the difference in expected value uh, here, if it's positive, that means the high uncertainty has higher value. If it's negative, means the high uncertainty has lower value. And the y-axis is how often were you interested in the high uncertainty asset. And some of these normative individuals, they would do something like this. That is, they would ask to sample, let's say, the high variance uh, asset all the time regardless of its value. Uh, according to the theory, by the way, it's also normative to sample to want to sample the low variance asset because you might prefer to not resolve your uncertainty early. That's okay too, as long as you're not sensitive to value. Okay. All right. But as I said, these are a minority of people, uh, and the majority uh, do this. The majority are actually uh, very sensitive to value. So in the way we see, you see, all these functions have a slope. They, they rise uh, with the value. Some people are uh, strictly sensitive to value. That means the psychometric uh, curves are centered on zero. Uh, the majority have a bias towards uh, the uncertainty. So, so you kind of prefer to see the high variance one, but it also matter how high it is uh, relative to the other one. Uh, a minority uh, are shifted to the right, meaning I'd rather see the more certain one. Um, uh, An even smaller minority seem to prefer to see the low value one uh, and have an early result, but that, that's really a handful. Okay, and, uh, and finally, that's uh, here are our optimal people. And if you parametrize this across a bunch of subjects, um, this is um, a larger sample. You can plot here the weight of value. So this is uh, positive, means that you prefer to see the high value one. The weight of uncertainty positive means you want to resolve your uncertainty early. Uh, most of our points are centered here. So, there's, so, so you, you do want to resolve your uncertainty about high value uh, observations. All right. Um, and we also did uh, the same paradigm exactly the same way, but now people were given an endowment and they were told that we'll draw true prizes and then subtract them from the endowment, right? And so now here, a higher position on the screen meant you had a higher loss. So now all of a sudden, this one is the worst outcome. Um, so we controlled for that, but we got the same, uh, the same result. Again, people want to see, um, again, the posit uh, their, uh, it's positive in both dimensions. So people want to see the one that, the smaller loss, they want information about the smaller loss, and there's a little bit of an uncertainty bias. Okay, so, we, so these motives then, uh, tell us that, I mean, sorry, these uh, results tell us that both of these theories are correct. And they play, both of these motives operate for the early reduction of uncertainty. That's those people who sample according to variance. Uh, they seem to go by that. Uh, but also the people who sample according to expected value, even though value is irrelevant, um, they seem, they're better explained by models uh, related to anticipatory utility, such as savoring and dread, um, right? So, so both motives operate and they have different weights in different individuals, um, okay? So this is just to, uh, to get back, to tie this back to what I, what I told you, uh, what we were talking about in the beginning. Um, this anticipatory utility uh, business, savoring or dread, I think is something we can all relate to. I think it's something we all experience. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that from a strictly normative perspective, it's not really optimal. We just like to think about certain things. It doesn't mean that they reduce our uncertainty to a greater degree. It doesn't mean that they're more informative. It doesn't mean that they're more accurate, right? And I think that, just to, to, to zoom out and make like a bigger philosophical point, uh, it makes sense if you think about the world, the, the tasks that we, are, uh, that, that we do, like that open-ended investigation. 
where we really don't even know what the uncertainty is. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so this I would, I, I would regard as some heuristic that is probably useful in uh, allowing us to deal with such a complex world, right? Okay. All right, so now, okay, so, uh, so now in the second part of the talk, I have, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I hope. Oh, perfect, okay, because this will be a lot shorter. So, um, okay, so, uh, so then, um, so, so the, the paradigm that I talked about uh, right now, it's a very simple, it still has that very simplified structure, right? You know uh, how to investigate things, you know what you're going to learn from each of your choice. It's still a relatively simple paradigm. Um, but uh, what about pushing this a little bit more and um, looking at a, a situation that's even a, a little more complex where you have to self-organize an investigative strategy, and this is something that Celeste uh, touched on, and where you have learning on a bit of a longer time scale and you have to do a more complex calculation about the costs and benefits of learning, how difficult a, a learning episode might be and so on. Uh, so this has been treated, uh, this uh, has been uh, considered uh, from the, again, theoretical perspective. Uh, it's called the strategic student problem and uh, Celeste um, described uh, her version of it. There has been another study in the literature uh, from uh, Son and Seti, where they have, uh, where they look, um, where they have a, a, a they, do, they just develop a theoretical model uh, that says that clearly if you have a set of problems and you have to allocate study time, uh, you should always choose the problem uh, where you have the steepest, where, you, where you're on the steepest part of the, uh, of the learning curve, right? Because at any point in time you gain, of course, you gain the most, uh, the most of learning. Now, uh, so, so this is um, in a collaboration that uh, I have uh, with uh, Pierre Boudet and Celeste, we're trying to actually find, again, behavioral evidence for this. So it's easy to write a, a theoretical model, but uh, but there is no evidence that people can actually estimate their learning progress. If you think about it, it's quite a complex metacognitive uh, ability. Um, and, so, uh, and so we're, we're developing the paradigm. Um, so, uh, but what I wanted to show you, so I don't, I don't have the answer uh, to that right now, um, but uh, there, is, uh, there are uh, indications there that, um, that are consistent with this sort of, um, uh, with a, with a learning-based um, uh, strategy. And that, and that is that observation that people tend to focus on tasks of intermediate difficulty. Uh, Celeste uh, spoke about this with infants, and we did a study in which we find that the same is true with adults. Um, so, um, so in the study, what we did is we brought people in the laboratory and we uh, let them play this game that we call Guitar Hero. Uh, and what happened uh, in this game was people saw a, a, a stream of dots that were, uh, and they had to press a button whenever a dot hit the central line. Okay, the stream of dot was irregular, just in Guitar Hero, you really have to press the button at the right time. Um, and we um, and we gave people a, a choice, the ability uh, that they could choose. We gave them uh, 64 games, and we just put them there. And we said, you have play this for 40 minutes or X no a minimum number of games, and do whatever you want. We gave them no instructions whatsoever, just totally free play. Um, and the games were arranged in order of difficulty, and that was simply the game speed. Uh, these ones here were super easy. The last ones were super difficult. Um, and then we gave people the percent correct. After, so each game would last about 30 seconds. And when it was over, we gave them a display saying how many dots they, they got and also an indicator that they had played that game before. Um, okay, so the main finding here is that even though people had no instructions, uh, they, they consistently organized uh, their strategy and uh, this is the average. Um, this is uh, this is the average choice probability uh, across all all the people. So you can see that they started from the easiest game, uh, and then they ex uh, and and then they settled at some intermediate level of difficulty. 
right? Um, so if you look at the game number, the, the dot speed increased as a function of game number and the percent correct decreased. Okay? We had, it's interesting, we had only one person who stuck with the absolutely easiest, most boring mind numbing game for the entire 40 minutes. And then we asked her, why, how, why did you do that? Um, and she said, well, you're not paying me, so why should I make any effort? You're not paying me for case, why should I make any effort? But you can all see that that's a very counterintuitive strategy, and most people do prefer to challenge themselves um, a little bit. Um, okay, another remarkable, and this intermediate complexity will be generated by a strategy that uh, that chooses areas of progress, of maximal progress. But, um, but it's not, of course, evidence for that because there are many other mechanisms that can generate it. So that's what we're trying to tease apart, more direct evidence for learning progress based. Uh, another thing that was interesting in this, um, in this study is that almost everybody went all the way to the hardest game, okay? So uh, you can see this, this is by subject. Uh, we had a version in which there are only seven games and then a version, versions in which there are 64 games. So even in the 64, you see that almost everybody chose at least once uh, that very hardest, the very top game. And that's striking because by about this level, you know it's pretty much undoable. I mean, th these are very, very fast, right? But it seems that uh, you know, everybody wanted to check out what's happening. And we also told them that the, the, the speed progresses gradually on the display. Uh, but people wanted to check us out. And, and it's intriguing to think whether the, this might be a sort of normalizing strategy, um, in a sense setting the aspiration level, uh, if you, if you don't, especially if you don't know the cost benefits, if they're hard to compute of learning something. Uh, maybe what you do is say, well, what's the most difficult thing? And then you titrate your level of effort to that uh, in some way. Okay, so that's all I have to say for now. Uh, and okay, so I want to end uh, with one note is that.